Her room was the one she usually shared with Van. It was bittersweet to be back, to know that this year they wouldn't be sharing. Jeannie had been there when they tied the knot, so she'd had a chance to observe her twin's transition to wife, to feel the new distance open up between them. It was, she stared at her reflection in the old mirror affixed to the dressing table. The reason she hadn't outright refused her boss's very prosaic marriage of convenience proposal. Thing tossed her direction a short 48 hours ago. It had come at the end of a string of pre-holiday before she left instructions, and she'd actually written it down before her brain processed it as something separate from work. She'd looked up with a jaw that might have gone a little slack and caught him looking at her with a hint of amusement in his usually cool and collected gray eyes. In the rank and file, they called Lincoln Graham the Big Chill. Guinea tried not to think about the nickname, mostly because she was afraid she'd come out with it at the wrong time, not because it wasn't true. The man was not known for being warm and fuzzy, as evidenced by a proposal so devoid of romance she'd have thought he was joking, only he never joked with his staff. She'd seen pictures of him laughing, so had to assume he could joke, but probably not about marriage. Not when he was one of Dallas's most eligible bachelors, a billionaire romance waiting to happen. She turned from the mirror, wishing it were that easy to turn away from the thing, which wouldn't even be in the neighborhood of a thing if she weren't halfway through her thirties, with a biological clock ticking so fast it made her ears ring. Not that she'd said yes. She'd unslackened her jaw, mostly to stop questions spilling out her mouth. She could tell he liked that. He didn't want questions. He wanted an answer. So she told him, with amazing composure, that she'd think about it. He'd accepted this with no sign the delay bothered him. That made it feel more like a business merger than a people merger, so she decided she wouldn't think about it until she had to. Granted, it had turned out to be harder than she hoped, though easier the further she got from Dallas. Until Dex, she crossed to one of the narrow twin beds and sank down, a small package on the nightstand catching her eye. She picked it up. The tag said, Open at bedtime. There was one on Van's nightstand, too. Had her mom planned to put the newlyweds in the room with twin beds? It was possible. Or she'd planned to show Biff to his own room. That was also possible. Yeah, it had been quite a few years since Jeannie could figure out what her mom would do before she did it. Needing a distraction, Jeannie almost opened it. But her mom, no matter how bad her synapses, had a scary sixth sense for stuff like daughters who didn't follow directions, so she set it down again. She clasped her hands together, noticing they were already drier. She should dig out her hand lotion. So what if Lincoln Graham, super-driven, super-bachelor, had proposed like they were planning a business meeting, not a life? And so what if her old boyfriend had appeared out of the past? and she was spending Christmas in crazy town without her sister and with her sister's bitter stepchildren. So freaking what? What was so great about normal? Like she knew what that was anyway. If she said yes to the big chill, all that would change was her address, probably. If the convenience part meant what it seemed to mean, did it? The thought that it might mean more made her eyes pop wide as she tried not to think about what it might mean if she was wrong. Could not imagine doing that with the big chill. Since that felt too weird to consider without more input, though how she'd get that input she didn't know, she moved on. The old boyfriend had kissed her, not proposed, even though she'd practiced writing Mrs. Dexter James Tolliver about a thousand times in the not quite four years they'd dated in high school. And, well, it was Christmas and there was bad Chinese food waiting downstairs, and an early present to open when she came up to take something for her indigestion before going to bed at a ridiculously early hour because that's how it had always been. She looked around the room, so familiar in its unfamiliarity to the adult she'd become. Coming here always felt like she'd time-traveled to the past. This was the other bedroom she'd shared with Van, the holiday bedroom, the summer vacation one, the place where they'd struggled to fall to sleep in anticipation of the Christmases when they still believed in Santa. 
Funny how she could remember that feeling so clearly, when so many other memories had faded like old photographs. She'd hung on to belief for a whole year longer than she should have, just because she didn't want to let go of the magic. Her writing had given her back some of that magic. Her characters did impossible things, got happy endings. She snorted. Who needed those outside of fiction? Life wasn't about endings anyway. Endings were just the beginning of something different, something new. She gave herself a good shake and then had to smile because she couldn't get a lot of angst going in a room where she and her sister had been so very happy. Her ability to up the angst had gone down as she staggered toward 14 because 13 was like the epicenter, the locus, the black hole of angst. Her lips curved as she saw the faded ghosts of their past selves flitting around this room. They'd giggled, whispered secrets, sneak read books, and kept their cabin toys in the cupboard in the corner. The town bedroom was different, except it had twin beds, too, and town toys. In both places, they'd planted and plotted their futures, the ones where they'd become world famous at something or fly to the moon. Van had half made it. She worked at NASA. And Jeannie, well, she made intergalactic journeys in her imagination. She had a fan base instead of a spaceship. Her pen name was famous enough to be a guest at some smaller science fiction conventions. Oh my gosh, she groaned and covered her face with her hands. What would the big chill think about the novels, about the Star Trek uniform? Would he know what a red shirt was? He didn't know about the geek who wrote romantic sci-fi, who still stargazed and dreamed of a love that transcended time and space. He'd only met the efficient P.A., would he have proposed if he had known about the geek? Dex kind of knew, not about the books, but about her geek creds. He was the one who started her reading SF. All of a sudden, she wished she were back there, with Van, back when life felt simpler and crazy was slightly less crazy when her dad was still alive. And Dex was there, too, because you couldn't be three musketeers with only two. They'd been the musketeers in space, because space was more fun. The future had seemed so, so. She heard a soft tap at her door and knew who it was. She took a deep breath and stood. Time to boldly go back to crazy town. It's what all good red shirts did. Daphne spent most of dinner not eating. Instead, she sorted through the scraps of faux passwords and other detritus trying to get Wi-Fi. Guinea didn't mention the Wi-Fi was out even if she got the password, no reason to push the teen over the edge until she had to. Isaac would eat a little, then make notes in his notebook. Jeannie wondered about that notebook. And she wondered why they had to eat dinner under the watchful platter gaze of yet another inflatable green alien. At least it wasn't on the table. She must be tired because it felt like it studied her, and it was kind of like those old portraits where the eyes followed you. Creepy. Dex watched her, too. That wasn't her imagination. Every time she looked up from her plate, he met her gaze and smiled. She smiled back, then bent to her food, pushing it around on her plate and wondering why she hadn't frowned. Okay, she didn't want him to think she was still bitter, because she wasn't. She was waxing nostalgic, which was totally different from bitter. No one except her mom talked. Words bubbled out of her flowing from one topic to another. Updates on people Jeannie knew and people she didn't. Long detailed genealogies mixed with health histories and unproven medical treatments that totally worked for this person but didn't for that person, who had died, who hadn't but should have. How excited she was for this Christmas because it was going to be the best one ever. Jeannie could remember her grandma talking in a flow just like this, and her mom's hands twitching in her lap while she nodded and smiled and murmured agreement. Guinea and Van had been fascinated by Grandma's endurance and their mom's patience. They'd timed Grandma one time, and she'd talked nonstop for three hours. In hindsight, she could be impressed her mom hadn't tried to stop the flow. Jeannie had a horrifying thought. Mom had probably been around her age. Her mom's flow paused. She angled her head. Are you all right, dear? Jeannie felt the ruefulness of her smile. Just glad to be home. 
She meant it, so it was nice to see a delighted smile spread through the wrinkles on her mom's face. She seemed to be crumpling from the inside out, and Jeannie felt a pang, wondering if this would be the last Christmas with her. She wasn't, she realized, with awareness of how selfish the thought was, ready to be an orphan yet. Maybe she should say yes to the frostbite marriage, or she could become a cat lady. If you lived closer, it wouldn't be so hard for you to get here. Hadn't seen that guilt trip coming, though she should have. The funny part? She'd actually been thinking about quitting her job to write full-time and moving home, well, closer to home. Is that why the big chill had proposed the thing? Had he sensed how close she was to bolting? Dude hated breaking in new staff. She smiled again, bigger this time. I've missed you too, Mom. As expected, her mom closed things down early, with a firmness that even Daphne found impossible to resist. When both kids had trailed reluctantly upstairs, Jeannie bent to hug her mom goodnight. She cupped Jeannie's face with claw hands, her eyes suddenly lucid and filled with that secret excitement that always seemed to go with Christmas and incoming surprises. Don't forget to open your gifts, she said, her gaze leaving Jeannie's to move to Dex. Thank you for staying, Dexter. It will be so much more fun with you here. This will be the best Christmas ever. Jeannie managed to not frown. Just how long was he staying? Didn't he have some protecting to do back in town? Her mom's gaze moved back her way and Ginny smiled a bit too brightly. Can I help you get settled, mom? Her mom had moved her room downstairs some years back. Tonight I can manage. Okay. What was different about tonight? Jeannie felt a slight frown between her brows as she headed up the stairs. There'd been something in her tone, in her eyes, that made Ginny uneasy. But what could she do? When dealing with a mom, no meant no, even when it shouldn't. She'll be okay, Dex said, as if he felt her worry. Ginny paused, glancing back, but her mom had already rolled out of sight. Does she seem different to you? Dex's brows rose. Different from what? He had a point. What would be different for her mom would be acting normal. Jeannie resumed her climb, trying not to show how breathless the stairs made her. She'd been too long at a lower altitude. Dex thwarted her attempt to dart into her room and close the door in his face by stepping into the opening and resting his broad shoulders against the door frame. Dang, she'd thought he was hot stuff back then, but he'd filled out real nice. Jeannie gave him a wary glance as he reached inside his jacket and pulled out a paperback. Cosmic Calamity by D.L. Prescott. Her gaze flew up to meet his. Was he about to recommend she read her own book? I was hoping you'd autograph my copy. His grin had lots of smug in it. Her jaw dropped a bit. She snapped it shut. How did you know? How could I not know? He retorted. It's you. He paused. It's us, the musketeers. It was true. She'd taken the best of their flights of fancy and woven them into her stories. Just bits in each book. Not enough bits to recognize, she'd thought. She felt color creep up her cheeks because she'd mixed romance in there, too. In her fiction, the guy always came back for the girl. She took the pen he held out, then the book. She tried to pretend he was just another reader. Did you want it inscribed to you, or is it a gift for someone? The question was lame, since the copy was worn. He'd probably bought it used. To Dex, who gave me my first science fiction book to read. Much love, Jeannie, he suggested. He sobered some. It's good. I even reread it a few times. He flicked the worn edges with his finger. Though I was a little disappointed you didn't dedicate even one of them to me. She had in her head couldn't count the time she'd typed out the dedications, then deleted them a letter at a time. No one knows I'm D.L., she said. Why D.L., he asked, crossing his ankles and settling more firmly against the frame, as if he intended staying a while. Her gaze shot up to meet his. 
She lifted her brows and waited for him to get it, which of course he did. You didn't? He straightened. Dumb luck? She nodded and he burst out laughing. Every time they'd gotten in trouble, one parent or the other had said it was dumb luck. They were still alive to tell the tale. Dumb luck had played a part in her writing, too. She'd kind of tripped over her own, well, writing feet and thought, oh, of course, that's what I was looking for. That's what I was meant to do. She'd always been the one to plot their adventures. I'm really proud of you, Gin. She felt her insides warm at the diminutive of her name, said the way only he'd ever said it. But before she could think of a response, he added, So when are you going to quit that fancy job and come home and be a writer? My boss proposed to me. She heard the words come out, and her eyes widened in horror. She'd thought maybe she'd tell Van, but never Dex. Why would she think of telling Dex? As far as she knew, he was years and miles away. Why hadn't Mom warned either her or Van that he was back? Her eyes widened. If she found out Van knew... Dex's eyes narrowed. So you're engaged? She shook her head. I didn't give him an answer. She wanted to yell at her mouth to shut up, but that would be not shutting up. At least she hadn't called him the big chill. Dex's smile was oddly dangerous, or she had a big imagination. Good, he said. He leaned in close like he was going to kiss her again, and she found she kind of hoped, but he just smoothed a bit of hair back off her face and said, I'm glad you're back, Gin. Then he turned and walked across the hall to his room. He paused. Sleep well. Then the door closed between them. Sleep well, like that would happen now. Gini shut her door and almost leaned against it, but that was so romance heroine, she resisted the impulse and went to the bed instead. Sinking down, her thoughts spinning like a made-up gravity well, she latched onto the distraction offered by the present still waiting on the side table. The ribbon yielded easily, and she lifted the gaily wrapped lid. Inside was a small, glowing crystal. Of course, Mom had gotten into crystals. She'd gotten into pretty much everything at one time or another, usually after it was no longer cool. She picked it up and turned it in the light. It was warm, and her skin tingled, the sensation oddly pleasant. Not quite sure what her mom expected her to do with it, she set it back in the box. For some reason she couldn't explain, she felt better. It was pretty. She touched it once more. She must be more tired than she realized. It almost seemed that light flickered under her skin for a second or two. Neat trick. She set the box back down on the table and started getting ready for bed and for not sleeping well. Dateline. Notes from Isaac's strategic planning notebook. It's always good to have a plan. Dateline. From Daphne's cell phone. If fate was kind, I would be dead. And dad would find my body and feel guilty forever. Fate is not kind. Dateline. Advanced scouting party report. The humans appear docile, except for the large male, though his attention is focused on the female, as was predicted. Still no contact with the mothership.